Oversee, Understone, Day 5, Part 1. Mrs. Punk, Great Uncle Mary, said meekly, You are a good soul, and you remind me overwhelmingly of my old nanny, who would never let me go outside the door without taking my galoshes. Well, young Barnabas, I think. Oh, all right, Barney said sadly. I suppose so. I'll stay here. That's right, Miss Punk beamed. I'll go and make ya uh, ice, nice hot drink before bed. She bustled out of the room. You lucky things, Barney said enviously to Simon and Jane. I bet you find all sorts of marvelous clues just because I can't come. It isn't fair. As a matter of fact, you'll have the most important job of all tonight, Simon said impressively, and the most dangerous too. We decided it would be too risky to take the map with us, so you'll be in charge of it here. You might have to guard it with your life. <clears throat> Suppose the burglars came back again. Oh, don't, Jane said in alarm. That isn't very likely. Don't worry, Great Uncle Mary said, getting to his feet. But it's a responsibility all the same, Barney, so you aren't all, altogether out of things. Barney was not sure whether to feel important or pathetic, but he went obediently to bed, looking back as they set off into the dark. They saw his face pressed white against one of the upstairs windows and a dim hand waving them goodbye. Gosh, it's cold, Jane said, shivering slightly as they went up the road away from the village. You'll be all right once we've been walking for a bit, Great Uncle Mary said. He had insisted before they went out that they should wear <coughs> sweaters and scarves under their coats, and they were grateful. Now, everything seems terribly big. Simon said suddenly. They all spoke softly by instinct, for there was no sound in the dark night but the soft tread of their own feet. Only occasionally they heard a car humming past in the village and, very faint, the wash of the sea and the creak of boats at their moorings in the harbor below. Jane looked round at the silver roofs and the patches of black shadow cast by the moon. I know what you mean. You can only see one edge of everything. There's always one side in shadow, so you can't see where it ends. And the headland looks awfully sinister. I'm glad I'm not on my own. This was a confession she would never have made in daylight. But somehow in the dark night it seemed less shameful. Simon said it unexpectedly. So am I. Great Uncle Mary said nothing. He walked along beside them in silence, very tall, brooding, his face lost in the shadows. With every long stride he seemed to merge <coughs> into the night, as if he belonged to the mystery and the silence and the small nameless sounds. Round the corner of the road, away from the harbor, they turned off and climbed over a fence onto the headland. The road curved round inland again, and above them stretched the dark, grassy sweep of the slope up towards the standing stones. In a little while, they found the footpath and began the long to and fro climb to the top. Listen, Jane said suddenly, stopping in mid-stride. There was no sound as they stood there, but only the sigh of the sea. You're hearing things, Simon said nervously. No, I'm sure. Above their heads, from the top of the headland, still out of the sight, there came drifting down a faint, ghostly call. Woo! Oh, Jane said in relief. Only an owl. Horribly, I couldn't think of what it was. Great Uncle Mary still said nothing. They began to climb again. Then all at once, they hesitated, as if by some unspoken agreement, the dark curtain seemed to have come down all around them. What is it? A cloud's come over the moon. Look, it's only a little one. Like a puff of smoke, the cloud drifted away from the face of the moon as suddenly as it had come, and the land and sea were silver again. You said there wouldn't be any cloud. Well, there isn't much. Only a few little ones. The wind has changed, Great Uncle Mary said. His voice out of his long silence sounded very deep. It comes from the southwest, Cornwall's wind. It brings clouds sometimes, and sometimes other things. He went up the hillside, and they did not like to ask him what he meant. As they climbed after him, more clouds came up, ragged and silver-edged in the moonlight, scuttling swiftly across the sky as if some other wind were up there, stronger and more purposeful than the gentle breeze, blowing down into their faces over the slope. And then, looming over the dark brow of the headland, they saw the outlines of the standing stones. Magnified by the darkness, they towered mysteriously against the silver-washed sky and vanished unnervingly into the shadow whenever a cloud rushed over the face of the moon. In the daylight, the stones had seemed tall, but now they were immense, dominating the headland and all the dim moonlit valleys that stretched inland from the lights of the village twinkling faintly below. Jane clutched at Simon's arm, suddenly overawed. I'm sure they don't want us here, she said unhappily. Who don't? Simon demanded, bravado, bravado making his voice louder than he intended. Shh, don't make such a noise. Oh, grow up, Simon said roughly. He did not feel happy in the darkness, dark emptiness of the night, but he was determined not to think about it. Then he felt the coldness of the pit of his stomach as his great uncle's deep voice came back to them in a way that seemed to confirm all that Jane felt. They don't mind, great uncle Mary said softly. If anything, we are welcome here. Simon shook himself slightly, pretending not to have heard. He looked round at the stones surrounding them now, rearing up against the sky. This was the one. He crossed to the stone they had found the day before. I remember this funny sort of hole in the side. Jane joined him, 
calmed by his matter-of-fact tone. Yes, that's it. When we looked across from here, we were absolutely in line with the sun and that rock we started from over on that other headland. Funny you can't see it now. I have thought the moon would shine on it like the sun did. The moon's in another direction, out over the sea, Simon said. Look at the shadow. Come on. That's what we've got to follow. Oh, Brother Jane said as another cloud crossed the moon and they were left in the dark again. The clouds are getting much thicker. I wish they'd go away. There seems to be much more wind up here, too. She clutched her duffel coat round her and tucked her scarf in more tightly. Don't be long, Grand Uncle Mary said suddenly out of the darkness. He was standing against another of the stones, <clears throat> swallowed up in its outline so that they could not even make out his shape. Jane felt the shiver of alarm return. Why, is anything wrong? No, nothing. Look, here's the moon again. The night became silver again, looking up. It was as if they saw the moon sailing through the clouds instead of the other way round, racing smoothly across the sky, passing puffs and whiffs of cloud on either side, and yet no, never moving from its place. Simon said in flat, dull disappointment, It doesn't point at anything. He started at the stared at the ground beside the towering stone. Dark on the silver gloom of the grass lay the shadow cast by the high, bright moon, and it pointed like a blunt finger away from the Kamar head towards the long, dark inland horizon of the Cornish moor. Perhaps it points to some landmark we we haven't noticed, Jane said doubtfully, gazing in vain over the shadow-massed hills. More likely the Cornishmen used the landmark that's fallen down or been destroyed or just crumbled away. There's always been that risk, and it would mean we could never get any further than this. But he wouldn't have done that. I know he wouldn't. Jane looked wildly round her into the night, into the wind gusting over the bleak headland, and then suddenly she stood still and stared. From her place beside the great stone, that was their only sure mark. She had turned her head to the moon that raced motionless high over the top of Kamar Head, over the sea, and she saw, as if for the first time, the pathway of light that it laid down. Straight as an arrow, the long white road of the moon's reflection stretched towards them across the surface of the sea, like a path from the, a path from the past and a path to the future. At its edges, it danced and glimmered as the wave ro waves rose beneath the wind. And where it ended, at the tip of Kamar Head, a clear, dark silhouette stood, against the shining sea-carried light. She said to Simon huskily, Look, he turned to see, and she knew that in a moment he was certain as she that this was what they were supposed to find. It's those rocks on the end of the headland, she said, outlined there. It must be. And we weren't supposed to use the shadow as a pointer this time. We had to stand here by this stone and let the moonlight itself show us the next clue. And that's what it does, Simon's voice rose as the familiar excitement of the, of the chase came flooding back. And if that's what... He meant by the signs that wane, but do not die, then the grail must be hidden somewhere in that clump of rocks, buried on the end of Kamar Head. Gosh, Kamari, we found it. He turned back towards the silent, dominating circle of the standing stones, and then hesitated. Kamari? He said uncertainly. Jane came quickly to stand close to him. Out of the shelter of the rock, of rock <clears throat> the wind blew her ponytail round across her face. She called more loudly. Kamari, where are you? There was no answer but the rise and fall of the sighing wind, loud enough now to drown the distant murmur of the sea. Jane, feeling very small indeed after, under the ghostly group of great stones, took hold of Simon's sleeve. Her voice quavered in spite of itself. Oh, Simon, where's he gone? Simon called into the growing wind. Great Uncle Mary! Great Uncle Mary! Where are you? But still there was nothing but the darkness and the high white moon sailing now dark, now light, and the noise <coughs> of, the moon, of the wind. They heard the husking wail of the owl again, nearer this time, over the headland in the opposite valley, a friendless, friendless, inhuman, desolate sound. But Jane forgot everything but the loneliness of the dark. She stood speechless with fright as if she knew a great wave were bearing down on her and she could not move out of its path. If she had not been there, Simon would have been as paralyzed by fright himself. But he took a deep breath and clenched his fist. He was over here before, he said, swallowing. Come on. He moved in the direction of the other standing stones, barely visible now in the blackness. Oh no, Jane's voice rose hysterically, and she clutched at his sleeve. Don't go near them. Don't be stupid, Jane, Simon said coolly, sounding much braver than he felt. Another owl hooted unexpectedly on the other side, towards the end of the headland. Oh, Jane said miserably, I want to go home. Come on, Simon said again. He must be over there. Over here. I expect he can't hear us. This wind's getting up like anything. He took Jane's hand and unwillingly she moved with him towards the dark looming shapes of the standing stones. The moon dimmed and disappeared in the depths of a bigger cloud so that only a dim luminous glow from the stars gave shape to anything at all. They went gingerly through the darkness feeling that at any moment there might, might, might collide with something unseen, panic suppressed only by the desperate hope of finding their great uncle, 
uncle suddenly at their side. He seemed a very strong and necessary refuge now that he was not there. They were right among the standing stones now, and they could feel rather than see the black rock pillars rearing up around them. The wind blew gustily, singing through the grass, and again the, they heard the owl cry below them out of the dark. They moved slowly together, straining their eyes to peer ahead. Then the ragged cloud turned silver again, and the moon came sailing out through the flying wisp at its edge. And in the same moment, they were aware of a tall, dark shape looming up before them, where no stone had been before. It seemed to swell as the wind blew, so that suddenly they saw that it was no stone, but the tall figure of a man, all in black, with a long cloak that swirled in the wind as he turned, towering over them. For an instant, the moonlight caught his face as he turned, and they saw eyes shadowed under dark, jutting brows, and the flash of white teeth in what was not a smile. Jane screamed, terrified, and hid her face in Simon's shoulder. And then at once the moon was covered again by cloud, and the threat and roar of the darkness seemed to rear up all around them. Without a word, they swung round and ran, stumbling, driven by panic, away from the silent standing stones and down the hill until, with an enormous flooding of relief, they heard the call of a familiar deep voice. As they looked again, or looked ahead, gasping, they saw Great Uncle Mary silhouetted against the lighter background of the sea, standing before them on the path. They rushed to him, and Jane flung her arms around his waist and clung to him, sobbing with relief. Simon had just enough self-possession left to stand on his own. Oh, Gamary, said breathlessly, we couldn't find you anywhere. We must go down from here quickly, his great uncle said, lowering, or low and urgently, holding Jane to him and stroking the back of her quivering head. I was looking for you. I knew there was something in those cries that was not like an owl. Come quickly. He bent down and picked Jane up in his arms in one swift movement as if she had been a baby. And with Simon close at his heels, he strode off down the hill, keeping to the path that they could just see as moonlight flashed through the racing clouds. Simon said, panting as he trotted along, There was a man up there. We saw him all of a sudden, out of the dark. He was all muffled in a big coat like a cloak, all in black. It was horrible. I went to find them, Grand Uncle Mary said. He must have got past me. Then there were others. I shouldn't have left you alone. Jane, shaken in his arms as he shaken in his arms as he loped down the hill, opened her eyes and looked back over his shoulder at the top of the headland with the dark fingers of the standing stone still pointed up into the sky. And in the movement before they disappeared over the horizon, she saw that there were twice as many shapes as there had been before, The other, with other black figures standing among the stones. Hey, Mary, they're coming after us. They dare not follow while I am here, Great Uncle Mary said calmly, and he went down the slope at the same time, long, at the same long, easy stride. Jane swallowed. I think I'm all right now, she said in a small voice. Could you put me down? Hardly pausing, Great Uncle Mary set her on her feet again, and like Simon, she half ran beside him to keep up. They reached the bottom of the slope, crossed the field to the road, feeling it reassuring place after the vast, bleak emptiness of the headland. The wind no longer whined around their ears down here, and they heard again the friendly, soft murmur of the sea. That man, Simon said, that man we saw, it was him, Gamary, the one we'd never seen before. It was the man you rescued me from, the man who chased me, with the boy, Jane said in a small, frightened voice, looking straight ahead at her at the, of her at the twinkling village lights as she walked. But I recognized him straight away when the moonlight shone on his face. That's why I was so scared. It was the Viser of Trewissick, and he's the man who saw my outline of the map in the guidebook. Chapter 9. Barney left behind, flattened his nose against the window of Jane's bedroom. He saw Simon and Jane glance up and wave, but Great Uncle Mary was marching along without looking to right to right or left, a tall, thin figure vanishing into the dark. Barney smiled to himself. He knew that he turned his stride very well. He peered after them until he could see nothing in the darkness but the lights of the village dancing in the black rippled water among the ghostly boats. From the withers' yacht there was no light at all. He turned away from the window, sighing a little at the frustration of being left out. To comfort himself, he took a firmer hold on the telescope case which Simon had solemnly handed over to him when they came up to say goodbye. At once he felt better. He was a knight entrusted with a sacred mission. He had been wounded in battle, but had to guard his secret just the same. He bent each leg gently in turn and winced at the burning tightness of the skin over his knees. The enemy were all round, hunting the secret which he held in his charge, but none of them would be able to get near. Now that, now then, back he come to bed, Miss Falk said behind him unexpectedly. Barney swung round. She was standing massive in the doorway, doorway with the light from the landing stream streaming around her, watching him. Barney's fingers instinctively curled tighter around the cool metal case, and he came towards her, patting softly on his bare feet. Mrs. Poff backed out onto the landing to let him through the door. As he passed close to her, he, she reached out her hand curiously. What's that you got there? 
Barney jerked the case out of her reach and then quickly forced a laugh. Oh, he said as casually as he could. It's a telescope of the captains I borrowed. It's jolly good. You can see all the ships going past out in the bay. I thought I might be able to watch the others go down to the harbor with it, but it's not much good in the dark. Oh, yeah, Miss Park seemed to lose interest. Fancy that. i never seen the captain use any telescope. Still, there'll be all sorts of strange things in this house, more than I shall ever know about. I'll be bound. Well, good night, Mrs. Park, Barney said, making for his room. Good night, my dear, Mrs. Park said. Just give me a shout if you want anything. I reckon I'll be going to bed myself soon. My days of walk, waiting up for fishermen are over. She disappeared downstairs and landing, and the landing light went out. Barney switched on the lamp at the side of his bed and quietly closed the door. He felt unprotected and rather excited still without Great Uncle Mary in the house. He thought of pushing a chair against the door, but changed his mind when he remembered that Simon would fall over it when he came back. The last thing he wanted was for anyone to think that he had been worried at being alone. He took the manuscript out to have one last look and to guess what Simon and Jane might find from the shadow of the standing stone. But he could see nothing in the rough picture of the stones and the moon. Suddenly, sleepy, he slipped the roll back and turned out the light, snuggled down into the bedclothes with the case clutched to his chest and fell asleep. He never knew exactly what it was that woke him. When through the confusion of half-dreams and imagined noises, he realized that he was awake. The room was quite dark. There was no sound but the constant murmur of the sea, very faint on this side of the house, but always in the air. But from the way all his senses were straining to catch something, he knew that a part of him, which had not quite gone to sleep at all, was warning him of some danger very near. He lay very still, but he could hear nothing. Then there was a very faint creak behind him from the direction of the door. Barney felt his heart begin to thump a little faster. He used the hearing... He, he's used to hearing noises at night. Their flat in London was part of a very old house which creaked and muttered all the time at night and as, as if its walls and floors were breathing. Although he had never been awake here long enough to find out, he guessed that the Grey House probably did the same. But this noise somehow was not as friendly as those. Barney did what he did at home whenever he woke up and heard a noise that sounded more like a burglar than an ordinary creak of the floor. He made the small grumbling yawning whipper that people give sometimes in their sleep and turned over in bed as if he were settling himself down without waking up. As he turned, he half opened one eye for a quick look, look round the room. At home, when he did this, there was never anything to see at all, and he fell asleep again, feeling rather foolish. But this time, it was different. By a faint line of light, he could see that the door was standing open, and near it the glow of a small torch was moving across the room. The light of the torch stopped quite, quite still as he moved. Barney snuggled into his new position, lay still, and breathed deeply for several minutes with his eyes closed. Gradually he heard the small voices begin again. He lay listening, more perplexed than frightened now. Who was it? What were they doing? It can't be someone who wants to knock me on the head, he said to himself, or they'd knock me on the head before this. They don't want to wake me up, and they don't want to make a noise. They're looking for something. He groped under the bedclothes, careful not to show any movement or make a noise. The telescope case was there, and he kept tight hold of it. Then he heard another sound. The person moving noiselessly about his room in the dark sniffed very slightly. The noise was almost Im imperceptible, but Barney recognized it as a sniff he had heard before. He grinned to himself in relief, feeling his muscles relax. Very slowly, he edged his hand out from under the bedclothes towards the bedside table and switched on the light. Mrs. Pock jumped, dropped her torch with a clatter, and clapped her hand to her heart. For some seconds, Barney was completely dazzled by the sudden light flooding the room, but he blinked his eyes clear in time to see disappointment and surprise on her face. Quickly, she pulled herself together and gave him a broad, reassuring smile. There now, and I thought I hadn't waked you up. What a pity. I'm sorry, my dear. Did I frighten you? Barney said bluntly, What are you doing, Miss Spock? Came up to see if you was all right and sleeping properly, and I thought while I was up here I'd pick up your dirty cup to wash, wash up with the rest of the things downstairs. Had your Horlicks up here, remember? Bless the boy, she added finally. He's half asleep still. Barney stared at her. He did feel sleepy, but not too sleepy to remember Jane coming into his room when he had first gone up to bed and saying, Mrs. Park said I would pick up <clears throat> your cup if you'd finished, or do you want any more? Jane took my cup down. Mrs. Park looked vaguely around the room and gazed wide-eyed at his empty bedside table. So she did it, did then. It slipped, quite slipped my mind. What a silly old thing I'd be. Well, I leave you to go back to sleep, my love. I'm so sorry to have waked you. She bustled with almost comical speed out of the room. Barney had almost fallen asleep again when he heard low voices outside the door and Simon came in. He shot up in bed. What happened? Did you find anything? 
Where did it go? Did you go? Nothing happened much, Simon said wearily. He peeled off his windbreaker and sweater and dropped them on the floor. We found where we've got to go next, where the next clue leads. It's those rocks at the end of Kamar Head, right over the sea. Did you go back and look? Is there anything else? No, we didn't. Simon was abrupt, trying not to remember the nastiness of the moments when he and Jane had been alone in the dark. Why not? The enemy, the enemy were up there, that's why. All around us in the dark, and one of them was the man who chased me that day with the boy. Only Jane says it was the vicer. I don't know. It's awfully complicated. Anyway, we ran away, and nobody followed us. Funny. They all seemed scared of Gamari. Who were they? Dunno, Simon yawned hugely. Look, I'm going down to have some cocoa. We can talk in the morning. Barney lay down again, sighing. Oh, all right, oh. He jerked up. Wait a minute. Shut the door. Simon looked at him curiously and pushed the door shut. What is it? You mustn't say anything in front of Mrs. Pomp. Not a word. Tell Jane. We shouldn't. She, w she wouldn't understand anyway. Oh, Barney said importantly. That's what you think. I woke up just now and she was snooping around the room in the dark with a torch. Good job I had the map all safe. She's after it. I bet you she's after it. I think she's bad. Hmm, Simon said, skeptically looking at him. Barney's hair was ruffled and his eyes shadowed with sleep. It was very easy to believe that when what he was describing had been no more than a dream. When they went downstairs in the morning, Mrs. Pock was bustling energetically about the kitchen, beating eggs in a bowl, <clears throat> with her elbow flicking up and down like a machine. Breakfast, she said brightly. Barney watched her closely, but he could see nothing but good humor and beaming honestly. And yet, he said insistently to himself, she looked so guilty when I turned on the light. It's a wonderful day again, Jane said happily as they sat down. The wind's still quite strong, but there isn't a cloud anywhere. It must have blown them all away. Oh, well, let's hope it doesn't blow the marquee away as well, Mrs. Pock said, putting an enormous jug of creamy yellow milk on the table. What marquee? What? Mrs. Pock opened her eyes. Haven't you seen the posters? Why, it's tis carnival today. Day today. People come in from all around, even from St. Astle. <clears throat> all sorts of things go on. There's a swimming gala in the harbor, then the band comes out, and there's dancing all the way up the street from the sea. They play the floral dance. You know the tune, surely. She began to sing lustily. I know what Simon said, but I thought they only danced it somewhere else. Helston, said James. The Helston furry dance. Yes, so they do, Miss Park said. I reckon they copied it from, a, from us myself. Everyone knows Trewistic's floral dance. It was dance in my grandmother's time. Everyone dressed up gay and fancy in costume, and there's a great crowd in the street all dancing and laughing. No one goes out fishing today. There's a great marquee in the field behind the village and all kinds of stalls and games and wrestling. Then when the sun begins to go down, they crown the carnival queen, and they stay around the harbor long after it gets dark and dance in the moonlight. Tis a long time before anyone wants to go to sleep in Tewissick, carnival day. What fun, Jane said. Hmm, Simon said. Oh, you mustn't miss it, Mrs. Pollock said earnestly. I shall be there every minute. Tis like the old days all over again. Eh, hey, but now I stand talking, and you scrambled eggs were beginning hard on the stove. She turned and sailed out of the room. It does sound fun, Jane said reproach reproachfully to Simon. I dare say. We've got other things to do. Of course, if you'd rather go to the carnival than find the grail. Shh. Barney looked nervously at the door. Oh, don't worry about her. She's all right. Great Uncle Mary's a long time coming down, isn't he? I didn't mean it, Jane said meekly. Actually, I want to want to, to do more than anything is get back up on the headland so we can go and find that rock. We can't go without the Mary. I wonder if he's awake. I'll go see, said Barney. And Barney slipped from his chair. Hey, where be off to? Miss Pock nearly collided with him, carrying her tray through the door. Sit down and eat this now, while well, tis hot. I was going to call Great Uncle Mary. Now you leave him be, poor old gentleman, Miss Pock said firmly. Gadding about, about in the middle of the night, tied natural at his age. No wonder he's having a good long sleep. Night fishing, indeed, and not a fish to show for it all, after all that tra traipsing about. You proper weared him. Weared <clears throat> weird him last night, I reckon. You remember we aren't all as young as you three. She wagged her finger at them. Now you get along into the sun after your breakfast and let him have his sleep out. She departed again, shutting the door behind her. Oh dear, Jane said at last. She's right, you know. Great Uncle Mary is quite old, really. Well, he's not daughter, and Simon said defensively. He doesn't seem old at all sometimes. He went like a rocket last night and carrying you. It was all I could do to keep up after him. Well, perhaps this is... The after effect, Jane's conscience was beginning to nag. Last night must have been an awful strain on him. 
what with one thing and another, I don't think we should wake him up. It's only nine o'clock after all, but we haven't made any plans or anything, said Barney. Perhaps we just ought to wait here till he does wake up, Simon said despondently. Oh no, why should we? He wouldn't mind if we went on the onto the headland. He could follow us when he's had a sleep. Didn't he say we shouldn't go anywhere without him from now on, Barney said doubtfully. Or anyway, not without telling him. Well, we can leave a message for him with Mrs. Polk. No, we can't. Barney thinks Mrs. Polk is one of the enemy, said Simon skeptically. Oh, surely not, Jane said vaguely. Well, anyway, we don't really have to leave a message. He's bound to guess where we've gone. There's only one place any of us would want to go, and that's to the rocks on Kamar Head. We can say to Mrs. Polk that he'll know where we've gone, just like that, and then she'll tell him and he'll understand. We can say we've taken Rufus for a walk, said Barney hopefully. That's not a bad idea. Where is he? In the kitchen. I'll go get him. Tell Mrs. Pock while you're there, and tell her we'll see her at her beloved carnival. We probably will anyway. Barney bolted the last of his scrambled egg and went out to the kitchen, munching a piece of toast. Simon suddenly had an idea. He got up and crossed it to the window and peered out down the hill. He turned back quickly to Jane. We might have known. They're watching us already. That boy's at the bottom of the road sitting on the wall, not doing anything, just sitting there, looking up here. They must be waiting for us to come out because they don't know whether we found a clue last night that will lead us somewhere. Oh, gosh, Jane bit her lip. That, their night on the headland had left her more deeply nervous than ever before. It was as if they were fighting not people, but a dark force that used people as its tools and could do what it liked with them. Isn't there a back way out of the house up to the headland? I don't know. How funny. We've never looked. Well, we've been doing other things. I suppose if even if there was one, they'd be watching it. Well, the only person who'd be likely to know about a back way is that Bill, and he's at the front. There's no harm in looking. Barney's had come back. Barney had come back with Rufus lop, lollipopping <coughs> joyfully at his side. There is a way, he said. You can get through the hedge at the top of the back garden. I found it one morning before you were up. Rufus showed me, actually. He was dashing about, and suddenly he disappeared, and then I heard him barking miles away outside, halfway up the headland. You come out into a lane, and then you're out on Kamar Head before you know it. It's a good way out because they wouldn't expect us to go through. There's no gate or anything. Gamary won't know anything about that way, Jane said suddenly. He'll come out the front way, and they'll follow him. It'll be just as bad as if they followed us in the first place. No fear, Barney said confidently. He'll shake them off somehow. I bet you this one, this is one time they won't have the slightest idea of where we are. When the children were gone and the house lay silent, Mrs. Pock spent two brisk hours working downstairs. She took care not to make a noise. Then she sat down in the kitchen to drink a leisurely cup of tea. She made the tea very strong, using one of the captain's best cups, very large and made of thin, almost translucent, white china. She sat at the kitchen table sipping from it, the look of great secret satisfaction on her face. After a while, she went to a cupboard under the sink, pulled out her big shopping bag, and took from it a brilliant jumble of colored ribbons with an elaborate feathery structure not unlike a red Indian headdress. She set this on her head, looked at herself in the mirror, and chuckled. Then she carefully put it aside and poured out some more tea in a fresh cup. She put this on a tray and sailed out into the hall and upstairs, a great smiling, mysterious get Galilean of a woman. Without knocking, she opened the door of Great Uncle Mary's room, went in, and sat down the tray by the bed. Great Uncle Mary was buried in bedclothes, breathing heavily. Mrs. Pock pulled back the curtains to let the light pour into the dim room, bent, bent down, and shook him roughly by the shoulder. As he stirred, she drew back quickly and stood waiting, beaming down at him with her usual doting motherly smile. He yawned, groaned, and clutched his head sleepily, running his fingers back through the untidy white hair. Time to get up, Professor, said Mrs. Pock brightly. Nice long rest I let you have after all that gathering about last night. Done you good. I'll be around, I'll be bound. Not as, not all as young as we used to be, are we now? Great Uncle Mary looked at her and grunt, grunted, blinking himself awake. Drink his tea now, and I'll go and get his breakfast. Mrs. Pock, rich voice flowed as she turned to twitch the curtains tidy. Can have it in a peace and qu blessed quiet for once. The children have been out for hours. Suddenly, Great Uncle Mary was very wide awake. He sat up, sat up. Straight back, startling sight in his bright red pajama jacket. What time is it? Why, it's tis gone eleven, said Miss Pock beamed at him. Where have the children gone? Now don't you worry about them. They can look after themselves well enough for one day. Little idiots, where are they? His forehead creased. No, no, Professor, Miss Pock said chingly. Gone off to save you a journey they have, as a matter of fact. Awful well brought up little things they are. For all their mothers, a bit higgledy piggledy begging your pardon, gone off to Truro for thee. Truro? Mrs. Pollock smiled innocently. 
Yes, that's right. Young Simon answered the telephone this morning. Nasty machine, she added, confidingly, shuddering slightly. Near scared me out of my life, screeching away. Talked to the man on the other end, of the end for a long time, he did. And after, he came to me and said, All serious, bless his heart, Mrs. Park said says that was a friend of Great Uncle Mary's on the telephone from the museum at Truro, saying he's gone to see us all, see us all very urgently, got to see us all very urgently about something. Who was it? Wait a minute now, Professor. I'm not finished. I reckon we ought to go off at once if our great uncle's still asleep. Young Simon says to me, and catch the bus. Then he, then he can come on after us when he wakes up. Who was it, Great Uncle Mary insisted. Simon didn't give me no name. Very important he made it sound. So off they went, the three of them, and got the bus into St. Austell. Don't worry, Mr. Fox said, just to tell you, tell our uncle, great uncle for us. You should never have let them go alone, Great Uncle Mary said curtly. If you'll excuse me, Mrs. Fox, I should like to get up. Of course, said Miss Fox indulgently, still smiling and unruffled, she sailed out of the room. Within minutes, Great Uncle Mary was downstairs, fully dressed, frowning to himself and occasionally muttering anxiously. He waved away his breakfast and went striding out of the gray house. Mrs. Park, watching from the doorstep, saw his big battered car appear on the road and roar off, leaving a great black smear of smoke hanging in the air as it disappeared out of the village. She smiled to herself and went back into the gray house. A few moments later, she came out again, a small secret smile still hovering round her mouth, locked the door behind her and went off with her shopping bag down the hill to the harbor. A few bright red and blue feathers nodding over the top of the bag as it swung at her side.